Good morning, and welcome to Watkins United. It's really hot, humid. It's good to be in here kind of morning, right? It's so good to see you here in the sanctuary in person and to be with you on Facebook if you're streaming the service. 
It's good to be with you as well. Um, please join me in our opening prayer, and then we will follow that with our song. Lord God, in a universe that seems so immense, it is easy to feel insignificant as we gather here today. Yet we know that we are precious in your sight, unique individuals loved and blessed in so many ways. We stand in awe of the one who has created all things and, dedicated this, and dedicate this time in our day and all our days to your service. Accept this offering, we pray, our sacrifice of praise and worship. Amen. And now please join me in, stand and join me in singing hymn number 92, For the Beauty of the Earth. We will sing verses 1, 3, and 6. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of ear and eye, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony, linking sense and sound to sight. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grace. For thyself, best gift divine, to the world so freely given. For that great, great love of thine, peace on earth and joy in heaven. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grace. Let's remain standing for the affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's word. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit, we trust in God. We are called to be in the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to speak justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death and life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> And it is a good morning. Do you know what this is? A rooster. What does a rooster say? Except this is a gift from Mrs. Mara. This is a Spanish rooster. Do you know what he said? Kiki Riki. Kiki Riki. Isn't that prettier? Did you ever know that animals spoke different languages? <laughs> So this is my Spanish rooster, and he's special. We're going to talk this morning a little bit about Peter, 
Jesus and our rooster. Peter and Jesus and the apostles have come to Jerusalem, and Jesus is trying to tell Peter and the other disciples that he is going to have to leave them, that there are people who do not want him to be healing, do not want him to be teaching, and um, they will come and take him away. And you all, all you disciples, he says, you're going to say you didn't know me because you're going to be scared and running away. Now, Peter's a big, burly guy, and he has been with Jesus when it was hot and when it was cold and when they were hungry and when their feet hurt and never missed a beat. And he says, I would never, ever leave you. And Jesus looked at him probably pretty sadly and said, before the cock crows, you are going to deny me. And for little people, deny means you say you don't know. Uh, uh, you're, you're going to deny me three times. No, I won't do that. As it happens, the people came with, with swords and with clubs, and they took Jesus away. And Peter quietly went behind to see where they were taking him, kind of keeping in the shadows so that uh, they wouldn't notice him there. But he went into the place where they had taken him, and he sat down, and here came a servant girl. And she said, aren't you one of those Jesus people? He said, no, not me. You got me mixed up with somebody else. And she went on her way. And before long, another person came by, and they said, you're one of those Galileans, one of those Jesus people. He says, why do you all do this to me? I don't know that man. Leave me alone. And then another group came through. And they again said, aren't you one of these Jesus people? And he again says, leave me alone, leave me alone. I've never known him. Why are you people bothering me? Go away. And at that moment, the rooster crowed, the cock crowed. Can you imagine how awful Peter felt? Because he knew what he had done. And we do it. Uh, for little kids, you've been pestering your sister all day long, and they, she goes to your mom and says, you know, make him stop. And mom comes and says, are you doing this? And you say, me, 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 me. <laughs> wasn't me. Uh, we do it because we're scared. The good news is Jesus helps us be sorry. He will show us a way to be forgiven, and he will help us learn how to behave differently. Let us pray. Lord in heaven, we know we often make mistakes and we are heart sick over them. Help us to do the right thing, to follow your will and know that we can be forgiven. Amen. All right. Let's stand and sing our next hymn today, When in Our Music God is Glorified. It's hymn number 68. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. When in our music God is glorified, Okay. 
Well, good morning, and welcome to Watkins United Methodist Church. We're so glad you're here to worship with us, whether in person or online. I do want to point out in front of you, if you are in person with us, there is a connect card in front of you in the back of that pew. If you are new or visiting with us, we encourage you to fill that out, hand it to an usher on your way out, or, or another staff member. We'd be glad to connect with you as we journey together forward here. Um, on the other side is also a prayer request card. And so if you have any prayer requests for the congregation or just the pastoral staff to know about, I encourage you to fill that out and also leave it um, on your way out. Make sure a staff member receives that. Another thing that, that is new that I want to give you updates on are the children's worship bag. Did any children get a worship bag this morning? If you did, can you raise it up in the air? Don't spill everything out, but you can raise it up. There we go. Let me see it, Leo. You got one? Oh, oh, and we got Owen over here with one, too. Okay, great. If there are children amongst us, there are children's worship bags um, for those who engage in worship. Now, they're not distraction bags, right? Um, they are worship bags to engage in. There are, are coloring sheets in there and word searches and other fun things. There's also a pipe cleaner. If you can make the best pipe cleaner at our Pastor Collins um, sermon, you'll get extra points. I don't know what the points equal, but you can get them, okay? Um, but I encourage you to do so. Um, those are children's worship bags. We will be having children's church, which is third grade and younger, and our nursery reopen on August 15th. And so that is the date that we have a plan together. If you would like to go to children's church, third grade or younger, and of course the nursery um, for us as well. And so spread that good news to the people on what we can do with that. We do have our pastoral and offertory prayer coming up. And so a time in which we bring our cares and our, and our concerns. Time in which we celebrate life, but also name the struggles that we are dealing with this week. So I encourage you as we go throughout this to remember those and lift those up on behalf of yourself, your family, and other people you may know. It's also a response in the giving of our tithes and offerings. Those plates are on hold right now. And so we are kind of looking at the Delta variants in our area and ways in which we'll continue to social distance. I'm not sure you'll see me with a mask because, of course, I have a very pregnant wife at this point. So we are choosing to be cautious. And if you choose to be cautious as well, you're, you're of course, optional mask for us here um, at Watkins. We will open up just another housekeeping thing, so Colin doesn't have to remember to say it. Um, there's a, a door up here we'll open up for you to exit as well, so you can choose both exits to go out. We'd encourage you to fellowship after the service, but we encourage you to do that outside. Hopefully it's not raining, right, because that could be awkward, but um, fellowship outside so we're not close together, um, spreading our goodness of germs around with each other. Make sense? All right, let's pray. Will you pray with me? Generous God, you raise up the humble and poor, and you inspire us to generosity and love. Hear us as we offer our prayers on behalf of all of your creation. For God, you have purified your church as Christ is pure. For Jesus has entered into heaven itself as our high priest to remove sin from the earth. Fill us with generosity and faith, that we may reflect your loving compassion and grace throughout all of your creation. God, watch over the city and build our house. Enlighten our leaders and all in authority to forego the appearance of piety, the abuse of privilege, and the selfishness of power, that they may lift up those who are bowed down, sustain the orphan and widow, and lead generously on behalf of the humble. You see, when the poor and humble give generously out of their poverty, and when the privileged and wealthy contribute out of their abundance, we ask that you'd be present in your mercy as a restorer of life and nourisher in our old age. You call all in our community the responsibilities of stewardship and mutual care. 
grants us everything necessary for our common life together and lead us to share so freely that none may be alone or in want. For God, you love the humble and the needy. Be with all whom we pray for this morning. For God, you have promised to save those who are eagerly waiting for you. So God, just as we celebrated yesterday in a glorious celebration of life, may you receive into your eternal and glorious kingdom those who have passed, especially Gary Hamilton, whom we celebrated his life yesterday. Loving and gracious God, you care for all whom you have made, and you invite us into your love of abundant charity. Give us generous and compassionate hearts, that we may live in unity with one another in the spirit of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who's in his name, and we all ask all of these things. And we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying together in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand once again and sing our next piece, which is Graves into Gardens. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better. Nothing is better than you. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one. Turn morning to dancing. You give 
beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the Nothing is better than you. Last time. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Good morning. My name is Colin Higgs, and I'm grateful to be a part of the Watkins family this summer as an Isaiah Project intern. And today we are continuing our series of summer baggage and focusing on guilt. But before we begin today, will you please join me in prayer? Dear God, thank you for letting us have this opportunity to worship. Let the Holy Spirit enter this room and Fill our lives up so that we can live out how you created us to be. And in your name we pray. Amen. Man, so I wish Jane came up here earlier because she, like, took about half of this already, explained the whole context. So thank you. (laughs) Now, Rob's already got a hundred other things for me. But today we are exploring the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 69 through 75. And it says, Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl approached him and said, You're with Jesus the Galilean too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him, and those who were there, this man was, was with Jesus of Nazarene. And again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, You really are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So a little backstory about me is I went to Kentucky Wesleyan College in Owensboro, Kentucky. Have you all heard of Owensboro? Yeah, so the famous phrase is, oh, it's boring. Um, and that's slightly true because in Owensboro, it's surrounded by farms and suburbs, and the best thing around there is that it's right next to the river. But it's not like all the other college towns that you have, like Western Kentucky, where it's large and there's so many people there. But in Owensboro, Kentucky Wesleyan only had about 750 students the last time I was there. And so if you were going to go have fun, you either had to swim across the river or travel like two or three hours away. So you had to make your fun on campus. And But the good thing with being at a small school is you knew everyone and everyone knew you. So if they all knew your drama, you knew theirs. But on the flip side, 
everyone was able to grow very quickly to be almost like a family. And the big question that you have is when you live on a campus for eight months, what do you do when you go home for the summer? See, for me, I knew who I was going to eat with on Tuesday mornings. I knew who to study with, who not to study with. I was always the driver. I was always doing things. But when you go home, all your friends go back home also. And you kind of have to return to what it used to be like. All your friends are, have disappeared. See, everyone used to be a three-minute walk away. I could go from one end of campus to the other and probably find all 20 people that I knew. But now it's, again, either two hours away, they live in Las Vegas or Alabama, or they're in a completely different country. It makes it a tad difficult to hang out if you have to get on the airplane. But the one thing is, I knew when I went home, is I knew I had to keep myself busy. Because that's what I did on campus. All the time, I was doing something. So I threw myself into two jobs. One, I worked at the Boy Scout shop, and the other one was the lawn care service. But my friends did not have the same outlook I did when it came to summertime. See, for me, all my friends had gone, and I was like, oh gosh, I gotta fill my time somehow. And so they always wanted to talk to me, and they always called me, and it was text all day long. I remember one of my first nights after freshman year, I'd gotten home, I was all sweaty, and like I showered, and I was like, I don't wanna talk to anyone else right now, I wanna go to bed. <laughs> I'd been out mowing lawns too much. <laughs> and so I get a call at 11 p.m. from my friend Josiah, my best friend in the whole wide world. And I'm thinking it's an emergency. I'm like, why else is he calling me at 11 p.m.? No, he just wanted to talk to me and see what was up with my life. We had been gone from college for one week. It was like separation anxiety all over again. But it seems, it sounds like I'm complaining, but my problem is I didn't always respond. See, I would get a text and I thought I would respond, but it turns out you have to actually press on the buttons on the phone to respond. And I was not doing that. And so I was ignoring my newfound family I had on campus. And see, I felt incredibly guilty because they were making all this time for me, but I wasn't making time for them. And, you know, as James said, Peter also had a family. See, for a couple of years, he, he slept and ate and traveled, got hungry, was thirsty with his family that wasn't blood-related, but faithfully and mystically constructed. And Peter, he was not the average disciple. He was incredibly close with Jesus and considered to be the spokesman of the group, and he is mentioned considerably more often than the other disciples in the Gospels and in the early New Testament. But in that one night, he publicly dismisses that he is not Jesus' disciple. He says that he didn't even want to be friends with him in that moment. But we can always look at a situation like Peter's and say, I can do better, we can do better. But we won't know that until we're in the situation. And see, Peter, he had a chance with each denial. And the stakes of who is asking Peter increases and how he responds escalates with them. See, the first is the high priest servant girl, and he simply responds almost cluelessly, like Radar on MASH, if you all have ever seen that show. He just is clueless about it. But then the next servant comes along and attempts to ask others, and that's when he knows something's up, and he responds, but with an oath before God. No, I do not know the man, I swear upon it. And finally, I can understand the group around him, they're not convinced. And they notice that he has an accent. And that's when he begins to curse and swear up and down that he did not know Jesus. But see, that curse was not toward himself. It was not toward the group. The Greek word for that curse was toward Jesus. That if he casts Jesus' name down and he drags it through the mud just even a little bit, that they will finally let him go. That they will finally let him survive another day and stop harassing him. And see, if we did not have the rest of Matthew, Peter, would just be a failure for us. Someone who was an inspiration and dedicated disciple who fell from grace. And I think as Jane pointed out, sometimes we look in the Bible and we look at these people and we look at them as characters, unreal, like from Lord of the Rings. But we don't look at them like they're flesh and blood like us, that have true emotions, that yes, they were hungry, yes, they were thirsty, that they probably did get hangry sometimes. But I just want to mention that in that moment, Peter told one of his closest friends, his loved one, 
that in that time of need that he would rise to the occasion. And he did not. He chose not to in that moment. And in the aftermath of his actions, I want to repeat that he said he went outside and wept bitterly. I can't imagine the paralyzing effects of guilt he had. But if we do look at the rest of Matthew and the other Gospels and we go into Acts, we see that he recovers. So how does he do that? How does he not step in the wrong direction and run away or fall into shame? Because typically we associate the emotions of guilt and shame together, interchangeable, but that is not the case. You see, how we react to our guilt is the difference between changing our life and wallowing in shame. Being guilty is an awareness of violating a standard or a certain act or a consequence, but once we internalize it and we conceal it from the world and we personalize that emotion to an extreme manner, that's when we feel ashamed of ourselves. An example could be getting a bad grade on a test. You see, guilt says that I should have stayed home and studied last night, but I went out and said it and hung out with my friends. Shame, on the other hand, does not recognize it solely as a bad choice, but shame says I'm a failure. I'm an awful student. I'm just stupid. And once we have that conclusion, that's when we begin this self-fulfilling prophecy that if we tell ourselves that we're failures, that we are awful, that we're going to continue that cycle, that we're not going to change and make progress. And breaking out of that mindset is even more difficult. But I think today that we can label and define and equip ourselves to overcome those emotions so that we can be closer to the image of God that he created us to be. See, in our first step to breaking that habit of letting shame into our life and letting us drag it down, that maybe that we're feeling unworthy of grace, love, or peace, is to look at how we react to our mistakes. See, if we look at two people who betrayed Jesus in the chapter 26 of Matthew, that is Judas and Peter, and what do we see? We see following the crucifixion, Judas hangs himself because he gave Jesus over for greed. But then we look at Peter, and Peter waits for the resurrection, and he seeks the empty tomb. And Peter had every right to feel unworthy and follow suit of Judas, because potentially all of his growth, his maturity, his friendships, his close friend of Jesus, and his faith was placed on the line, and he chokes. And now he must wait three days, unsure, and uncertain of what the future has for Peter and Jesus. And see, when finally Jesus returns, he waits on the shore as the disciples are fishing. But Peter does not cower. He's not the last one on the boat when they recognize that Jesus is on the shore. No, instead he jumps off and swims. I'm sure the other disciples were like, okay, Peter, like, you can be the first one off the boat. But no, Peter jumps in the water, and he swims toward Jesus. And I can't imagine what is going through his head. Because when I make a mistake with my friends or my parents, I'm like dreading the conversation that's about to happen. I'm dreading the response. But what does Jesus do? Jesus, he does not yell. He doesn't smite Peter down for that. He doesn't punish or condescend. No, Jesus remains on the shore. Jesus shares bread and shares the fish with Peter. See, I can imagine all the disciples and Peter sitting down at the campfire on the shore and letting Peter truly express how he feels. Letting Peter have the opportunity to realize that was just that one moment, but that's not, how, that's not who Peter truly is. See, guilt and shame have many differences, but they have one big similarity in all of us, that typically when we make a mistake, our first reaction is to run away. The idea that if we remove ourselves from the equation, that that might solve the future issue, because if we're not there, we're not going to make the mistake again. That might remedy what has already been broken. But for me, that is too many what-ifs and might-bes because God does not want you to go away. God wants to be present with you. 
And this week, I was searching for an activity you could do, something that you could practice and wrestle with, maybe mull over this week as you think about this sermon. But I came to the realization that our summer baggage series isn't about doing something right now. It's not about an action. It's a time of peace and rest and relaxation, understanding that there are things we need to let go in our life so that we can be closer to God. And so this week, instead of an action, I learned of a man named Brian Stevenson, that throughout his career as a lawyer, he had one goal and passion, that he would provide legal assistance to those who could not afford it, that they were disadvantaged, and they were on death row. And after reading his story and the lives he touched, the lives that he said, or saved, there was one phrase in his book, Just Mercy, that stuck out. And it says, each of us is worth more than the worst thing we've ever done. Each of us is worth more than the worst thing we've ever done. Because as Jesus and Peter reunite on that shore, Jesus did not see the denials. He did not see the sins. He sees a beautifully, wonderfully made human being. And as I drove to work this week and met with friends and came to church, and as I looked down from this altar today, I realized that God does not see mistakes. He doesn't see judgments or your sin. He sees his creation in the world. And again, our first reaction to mistakes is to deny and to cower and to hide ourselves from God because the first question that pops up in our head is, why would God want to speak to me after what I just did? And because of what he would say right now, because we think that he's going to respond how we would react if we were on the other side of the table, we are scared of that emotion. But I think it's time that we kill that mindset, that we get rid of it. Because God does not pick and choose his relationship with you. We might act differently, but he does not give his heart in pieces. He does not deny that intimate relationship because you had a grumpy Monday and you yelled at somebody you shouldn't have. You might have did something wrong to your kid and he doesn't, he's not like, I'm taking Tuesday off because, you know, Colin did this. He's not taken off because we picked up our phone in the car and we accidentally hit somebody else. When we make mistakes, we must get out of that habit of thinking God does not want us because guess what? God loves you unconditionally. He's not taking time off. And he looks at us with different eyes than our own because we are his children. See, God is bigger than our mess, and the moment that we take a step back and recognize that the creator of the universe is not trying to shame us, he's not trying to guilt trip us, but giving us the opportunity to see what love is, what grace is, and forgiveness in our own lives. Because I know that our God that is filled with love and grace does not want us to punish ourselves or look in the mirror and define ourselves by our sins or our mistakes, but instead to look at ourselves and recognize that we are God's children. And that when we do make a mistake, that we look in the mirror and say, oof, that was a bad choice. But he also wants us to talk to him and say, and have that conversation. What does that look like for your life? How do we change and grow closer to God? I see, too often we close that door, but God wants to break that door down. So as we conclude today, I want to mention that I also am a very big visualizer. So as I was practicing this week for the sermon, I would come in here and I'd bring this right here and I would see everybody where they typically sit and I would make sure that you all were here so I could have that experience. But today I want you to act like your guilt is a house. That we pack what choices we made in our youth in the living room that the mistakes that we currently make today is in the dining room, the beliefs that you are unworthy of peace in the kitchen, that we need to punish ourselves in the attic. And I want you to walk away from that house because we don't live there anymore. 
We're in the house of God where the doormat spells mercy instead of welcome, where the door and the entrance is full of grace. The living room is full of forgiveness, and the kitchen is full of love, and the roof is made to protect us. And that old house full of lies does not compare even remotely to the fresh and renewing grace that God offers us. And sometimes we may look at that old house. We may think that we need to walk back in there, that we deserve that, but God has another plan for us. God offers another plan for us. There is always a welcome invitation. There is always an open table with God. And in that moment, we might need to act like Peter, not before the crucifixion, but afterwards, that we don't hide from God, that we jump into the water, however scary that might be, and that we just go to him. Because the awesome thing is, Jesus waits for us on the shore. Would you please pray with me again? Dear God, life can just be tough. We make wrong choices sometimes. But today, we're asking for your forgiveness, a new chance, a new beginning that as we live in your house, that we have those opportunities to come and close that intimate relationship with you and embrace you as hard as we can. And I pray that as we leave the sanctuary today that we jump in the water, that we just get soaking wet that we, to get, just to get closer to you. I want to pray over everyone in the congregation today and up here on the altar ready to play our last song. That we love you with all of our heart and minds and that we recognize we're not mistakes, we're not bad choices, we are each other, we are individuals, and we are your children. In your name I pray, amen. Join us as you're able for our final song. I cry to you in darkest places I will call incline your ear to me anew and hear my cry for mercy Lord were you to count my sinful ways how could I come for your throne yet full forgiveness meets my gaze I stand redeemed by grace alone I will wait for you I will wait for you on your word I will rely I will wait for you surely soul is satisfied so put your hope in God alone take courage in his power to say completely and forever one by Christ emerging from the grave, his steadfast love has made a way, and God himself has paid the price, that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice. storm now.
So before we do our benediction, there's two announcements. Our first one is that we're going to postpone water games on the lawn. Turns out there's going to be a thunderstorm, and we don't think that's very safe, you know, if it's lightning outside to have more water around. So that'll be next Sunday, same time at 4 p.m. And then our second announcement is there are texts still needed. And just one hint that Rob is very right about it, that it is super easy to do. Because I broke in, and I was trying to figure it out earlier, and, you know, I figured it out. So if I can do it, you all can definitely for sure do it. And so now hear this benediction. Now go and let the amazing grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.